Hello and welcome to covidrecovery.ie. Never in its history has Ireland faced a crisis of the size and scope of the COVID-19 pandemic. Equally, the democratic system has never been tested as of now. COVID Recovery is a group of medical and scientific professionals that seek to study the science, ask questions and offer alternatives. Please watch and listen with an open mind. The future of our children and grandchildren is at stake. Dr. Jack Lambert is a consultant in infectious diseases and a genital urinary medicine. He's been practicing in Dublin as a consultant at the Matter Hospital and he also has teaching appointments at the University College Dublin School of Medicine and Medical Science. And uh, Jack, if I may call you Jack, thank you for joining me. Good afternoon. Well, um, you're an expert also, amongst many other things, in infectious diseases, um, which is is absolutely key to what we're going to be talking about. And you have been very strong and you've talked a lot on, on media about this. Um, here we are nine months after the first cases were found and we don't seem to be any far advanced. What are your thoughts? Well, well, first off, I, I, since I arrived in Ireland in two, you know, 2005, you know, 15 years ago, I, I've taken responsibility of being director of the National Isolation Unit of Ireland, leading the Ebola effort, writing the guidelines with the, H, with the government on pandemic flu, on Ebola, on viral hemorrhagic fever. And I think we've never had a plan for any other infectious disease that involves lockdown as a primary plan. We, we need to come up with a plan that avoids lockdown and, and safely allows us to, the Irish population, to continue to live with COVID safely and to deal with all of the other components that are being affected by COVID, non-COVID related health problems, psychiatric problems, economic problems. So I think nine months into the pandemic, it's an absolutely a scary virus, but we need to actually come to grips with it and not just continue to live in fear. We need a detailed plan to move forward in Ireland and live with COVID safely. But are you suggesting there isn't a detailed plan? I thought the whole point about the advisors, uh, advising the Minister for Health and, and the Taoiseach and so on, I thought that, that was the whole point of it. They were going to come up with a plan, no? Well, I, I've not seen a plan, and this is the point. The point is the, the there is not cl clar clarity in, to the general public, to myself, to others, as to what the plan is. To live with COVID, you know, we, we've we, we've published details on you know different levels of lockdown. You know, level you know living with COVID, we go to this level one, level two, level three, level four, level five, but we've not come up with a detailed plan for you know ICUs. When are we building new ICUs? We said we have to stay in lockdown from May because we didn't have enough ICUs. What are our plans to build ICUs? You know, border security. What are our plans to guarantee border security testing? You know, community, you know, community COVID prevention plan. What is our COVID community prevention plan? What are the details to the public on using masks, using visors? You know, we, no, we do not have a detailed plan that, that I've seen. Um, that is transparent and, and we need a more detailed plan if we're going to successfully control this virus and live with this virus. But uh, Dr. Lambert, um, because you are uh, a professor in infectious diseases and so on, let me let me give you a layman's view for a moment, if I may. Um, like we do have a plan. The plan is, in fact, that if we lock everybody up in their homes, if nobody goes to the shops, the pub, the theatre, school, university, nobody or cinema, nobody goes anywhere, then this virus will eventually stop and we'll be at what is called zero COVID. Isn't that the plan? Well, 
That was the plan originally, but I think everybody has realized that you can't eliminate COVID. You know, you have to control COVID. You need to keep it at low numbers. Even countries like New Zealand, uh, you know, places in Australia that have gone into total lockdown, as soon as they end the lockdown, new cases arrive. Until we have a vaccine that will actually, you know, vaccinate everybody so that COVID no longer circulates. We need to learn to minimize the number of COVID cases, flatten the curve, keep it flat, without using lockdown as a, as a solution. But but you've 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 asked, if you like, in your answer, you've asked certain questions. I mean, like, and 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 the first one you've just alluded to is the vaccine. I mean, are we all just going to stay at home until a guy arrives at the door and says? Oh, I bring you the vaccine. Is that really what we're, we're going to do? And and although although Wall Street went through the the roof when the vaccine was announced, are we absolutely certain this is going to work? Vaccines haven't worked before, isn't it? Without being an anti-vaxxer, we don't actually know they're going to work, do we? No, and, and, and that's absolutely the situation. I'm, I'm very pro-vaccines. One of my children was involved in a vaccine trial long time ago with a meningitis vaccine. So I believe vaccines are critically important, but we don't have a licensed vaccine yet for COVID. Um, and even if we did have a licensed vaccine tomorrow, it's going to take three to six to 12 months to roll that out. So the solution of staying in deep freeze for another year is it's, it's been impossible to do that for nine months in Ireland. We can't go through another year of deep freeze waiting for a vaccine. So that is not a solution, but there is hope that there is light at the end of the tunnel. The question is, what do we do between now and 12 months, 18 months, 24 months before a vaccine is rolled out? That's the critical question. But I remember talking um, to somebody called Professor John Oxford in Britain, who's a virologist, and I remember him telling me, and this was back to SARS, for instance, another virus. I remember tell him telling me that viruses come and go, and there's never going to be a world where there is no virus. So you did say this is a very serious virus. Can you try and quantify what very serious means if you think in terms of swine flu or SARS or even just influenza? Okay, so I think influenza is the best, is the best uh, you know, analogy. Re influenza is respiratory virus, okay? We have a plan for pandemic influenza. Influenza kills millions of people. Um, so, but we don't use lockdown as a solution for dealing with influenza. We, we escalate hospital capacity, ICU capacity. We do have vaccines for influenza, but the vaccines don't always work, you understand? Sometimes the vaccines are, don't cover the influenza strain that we, we, we you know that, that circulates in the country so so i the way we, we prevent influenza is wearing a mask educating people on what to do you know the appropriate same precautions as, as covid so i think the difference is there is no covid vaccine so that makes it different from influenza but i think there's a lot of similarities we we need to look at covid and treat COVID the same as we do influenza. I think COVID is much more infectious than influenza, but it is respiratory spread. I think maybe it kills more people per population. COVID does than influenza, but they're similar in the way they're transmitted and they're similar in the way we prevent COVID, we prevent influenza. So I think we actually have to, have to think COVID, think influenza, the respiratory viruses, same strategies should be utilized. But um, I, I saw, strangely enough, a documentary of the Battle of Okinawa in 1944. And the, the documentary was obviously made a couple, at least two years ago. And all the people who were Japanese, obviously, talking about this in the documentary, all wore masks. So it seems to me, maybe back to SARS or whatever, that it, the Asians have grown quite comfortable with the idea of living with a mask. Is that so? 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think in the middle of flu season, they all wear masks, you know. And if you look, my in-laws are from Japan and Malaysia and Singapore. They've not gone into lockdown. They've kept the numbers low. They have thousands of people in the Tokyo train station all wearing masks religiously. Um, it's the thing to do. You do it. There's an assert, you don't need to force them to do it. You don't need the guarder to come around to make them to do it. If you tell people to do things and explain why, they will do it. And I think if our government stood up and said, wear a mask for the next year until the vaccine comes along so that we don't need to go back into lockdown, I think most Irish citizens would comply with that. And the mask, at least in the short run, is the critical solution. Using a mask appropriately, both indoors and outdoors in crowded locations, is the solution in the short term. And that's one really important message that our government hasn't given us, the Irish population. Okay, can we please don't uh, treat me as, as crass with this question, but it's meant in the best possible way. Once upon a time, they brought seatbelts into motor cars, and the vast proportion of people actually never wore them, you know? And they, they said, ah, I'm okay, and so on. And today, to see somebody in a car without a seatbelt is just incomprehensible. We we can't imagine it happening, apart from the fact that the, the car goes beep, beep. Isn't it this really, isn't the mask going to be seatbelts for COVID? Absolutely. I think it's, 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 it's you know, you can say, I don't like wearing a seatbelt, um, but it shouldn't be an option. It's a, the safest thing to do and it should be a legal requirement. So I think, that, but I think you don't need to have a law to make people use seat belts. 99% of people will use it, but you do, you, you, should have, you should reserve the right to have legal enforcement of using seat belts if people aren't doing it for their safety and for other safety. The issue that which you also made following up on what you said was you talked about wearing the mask indoors, whether we're at, at business or, or home or whatever, or pleasure or whatever. But isn't it true that as much, and it's the reason they allowed us play golf, for instance, that it's quite hard to transmit this COVID in the open air. So therefore, if, if people, and because we can't lock the whole country down, if people are going out, which they are, isn't it, isn't it very much, you can't send the police force and the army in to lock all the people who go out. Because there are more people on the street now. There are more cars on the road than there were last March or April. Absolutely. I mean, we, we, we're supposed to be in level five lockdown, but if you just walk outside on Echo Street, right by the Matra Hospital, there's, there's not a parking slot available. There's people walking around. There's people begging on the streets. So there, there, there's, there's, this is not a lockdown. This is, this is a, a theoretical lockdown. And, and, and so yes, absolutely. We, we can't enforce masks, but I would not recommend a mask getting back to that subject. If I'm walking on the, on Clontarf on the promenade in an open area with the wind blowing. But if we come out of lockdown in a couple of weeks, and you go to the city centre and people are queuing left and right on Henry Street and Grafton Street, waiting to go into stores, and, and they're nose to nose with each other, that is a super spreader event of COVID. Okay. So I think, so I think we, it, the rule, the, you have to use some common sense here, but you have to put the mask first as a prevention for a respiratory virus like COVID. It's the only solution we have in the short run. Uh, my final question is, Tsar has always been used ever since uh, Tsar Nicholas in Russia, and they now use it for the Tsar of traffic or the Tsar of whatever. So if Jack Lambert were the Tsar of COVID, what would you be telling the government tomorrow? I'd be telling the government to, when we come out, come, when we come out of lockdown, the only way to keep going back into lockdown is to stand up and really push the mask. I think most Irish would use it and teach them how to use it properly, both indoors and outdoors. And number one, I think we need to 
protect our vulnerable. You know, I think we need to put special messages that it's not just about, you know, going out in the community. It's bringing COVID back to nursing homes, back to care settings, back to elderly people living in those homes. And th these are sometimes working adults who are going back to the home. These are sometimes teenagers going back to the homes. We need to do a really good job of protecting our vulnerable because those are the people at highest risk of COVID-19. And then finally, we need to have a plan for our borders. We talk, we talk about banning international travel. We talk about, you know, and, and not allowing Irish to fly back for Christmas. But the elephant in the room is we have a border with Northern Ireland and people are coming back and forth in a very high prevalence COVID area in Northern Ireland. And they're coming in without any kind of scrutiny. And I'm not saying ban travel. I'm saying we need to have things set up so that they have testing in some situations as people come to Ireland, testing before they come back. We have to have uh, COVID prevention, masks, all these kind of things set up. I think it's critically important that we have a plan. Professor Lambert, Jack, uh, thank you so much for your contribution and uh, your contribution in total, I can tell you, uh, to the world of infectious disease in this country. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm joined now by columnist with the Irish Times, but currently living in the UK, Chris Johns. Chris, welcome to the show. Thank you, George. Pleasure to be here. Chris, it's interesting because you, you bring a, a perspective which not everybody has. Living in Britain, also writing to an Irish audience, you've seen this COVID pandemic and the reactions from both sides. How have you reacted? Well, although I am in the UK at the moment, I do split my time between Ireland and the UK. One of the reasons why I do write that column is that I've actually lived in Ireland since 1988. So um, I have a perspective that is Anglo-Irish. Um, and uh, both countries have had interesting experiences with it. I should say at the outset that I'm just recovered from a bout of COVID. So I have a, a perspective of having had it. So um, that concentrates the mind as well. I don't think either country has handled it well. I'm not a scientist, I'm not a medic, but I am mathematically literate. Um, I, I do know statistics and I followed the debate very closely from a, from a data point of view, from an evidence point of view. And that's my biggest criticism of both jurisdictions is that the, the scientists and the medics that have been advising both governments, I think have been quite poor at telling us what the evidence for their recommendations actually is. They may well be numbers backing up their recommendations, but in many cases, um, I think that uh, the evidence base for a lot of what they've told us to do is actually quite weak. And that, that's a long list and we could talk about that all day. But one small example that I would cite is the current furore in Ireland over takeaway pints. Um, my perspective on it is that all of the evidence for COVID is that it is mostly almost entirely caught indoors, and that this banning of outdoor activities um, worries me greatly. And it's not just the takeaway pints thing, which I think is, not, is a nonsense, quite frankly. And I think there are too many medics who just don't like alcohol rather than not liking COVID. And I think that that speaks to a wider point about public health messaging, which is that um, if you take the Japanese experience, for example, which is much better than most jurisdictions, the public health messaging has been hammering away at this simple fact that COVID is mostly caught indoors in crowded, unventilated spaces. And that's where all of the action should have been taken. So generalized lockdowns, I think there is a, a, a reasonable debate about whether or not they work. And I think there's a, a reasonable debate about whether or not um, specific actions should have been uh, focused on more than others. And the nuance and subtlety and data has been lost in this debate. Chris Johns, you, you said to me at the very beginning that you were mathematically literate. So how, do you, how did you react when Professor Neil Ferguson at Imperial College said last March, you know, there's going to be 800,000 deaths in the United Kingdom. Hospitals and ICUs are going to be overrun. Over here, um, the experts over here said there's going to be 80,000 deaths in Ireland and then the usual mantra hospitals and ICUs are going to be overrun. Um, 
and what's your reaction to the actual statistics? How have you felt reading them as a journalist? Well, it's it's reading them as a journalist, but also reading them as somebody who claims to be mathematically inclined. And what I did when I looked um, at that Ferguson comment was try to dig into the modeling, the mathematical modeling that he had done. Now, mathematical modeling is something that economists know an awful lot about. We build models of the economy, which have um, a read across from the models that epidemiologists build. And a lot of things go into those, a lot of data. So you have to ask questions about the quality of the data. But the critical questions about these mathematical models are the assumptions that they use. And there you have to get into a very nitty gritty debate about things like case fatality rates, infection fatality rates. And he made some pretty strong assumptions, which on a very cursory examination of his model looked questionable at the beginning. And I think so it has proved. So you asked my reaction to it. And I said, let's look at the model. Let's look upon what it was based. And when I found out that it was, first of all, based on flu pandemic and some of the assumptions, particularly about um, the fatality rate assumption that was used, I, at the time, uh, thought and said that I thought his assumptions were extreme. The interesting thing you must have watched a lot, of course, is the performance of the Prime Minister and his cabinet in the United Kingdom. But the most recent lockdown, we understand, was based on graphs and figures that were actually out of date. And also, um, you know, the Prime Minister who has had COVID is now going into isolation, which seems strange to me at any rate, like you a non-scientist, but it seems strange. How, how have you reacted to those kind of things? Well, I think the data presentation of the scientists at these meetings, at these press conferences has been ridiculous. Um, they could have done much better with the actual presentation of the data. We're told constantly in, in articles all over the place about how we live in an era of big data and how data visualization is the job that all of our children should be going into. And they've been absolutely hopeless at it. And as you say, they presented both incomprehensible and out of date graphs. And I think it's that first point that, that's actually as important as the second. A lot of the stuff that they've been presenting I stare at as somebody that understands charts and data, and I thought, what on earth is going on here? And I simply don't know. The second point you made about Boris Johnson, um, and speaking also as somebody that has fully recovered from a bout of COVID, and I consider myself to be immune now, I think it's completely daft that this man now has to isolate for 14 days, given that he is immune. I, I understand there are question marks about um, reinfection, but that these are very, very small question marks. And I think that if we were to, to, to do this objectively, mathematically, we would say that people who have had it should be given immunity passports. I should be allowed to be out and about now because I have had COVID, I am immune. It's probably the case, although we're not absolutely certain that I can't spread it anymore, provided I'm careful and still do the, the, the mask wearing indoors and all that sort of thing. I am a safe person. So I think that Again, you raise a point about, about Johnson, and it speaks to the vaccine. Is this what's going to happen when we're all vaccinated? Are we still going to be quarantined unless the entire population is vaccinated? So I get a vaccine now, and unless um, everybody else has had one, if I come into contact with somebody, I'm going to have to quarantine. That's the absurd logic of what they're doing. Now, you are unusual <laughs> from my point of view, is you're the first person I have ever spoken to, live or on television, who has had COVID. What's it like? Well, I was very lucky, I think, in that I had what I would describe as a mild to moderate dose. So I wasn't hospitalized and I didn't get very sick. Um, I, the main symptom that I had was an incredibly high fever which left me feeling very miserable, very sick for a few days. And it, did, and it did last the full 10 days, not 14. I wasn't sick for 14 days, but I was sick for about 10. Um, I was lucky in that it didn't go to my lungs. Um, I was certainly in a high risk category. I'm 62 years old. So I'm starting to get to that age where the risks from COVID are actually quite high. So I, I consider myself to be lucky. Um, it was thoroughly unpleasant. It means that I do take it even more seriously than perhaps I would have done. Um, and I wouldn't recommend anybody getting it. But that said, um, uh, that still leaves me as skeptical, if not more skeptical, about some of these lockdown measures and 
policies generally that they have been adopting towards COVID. But on a personal level, you've just cheered me up. In my 79th year, I'm assuming if I get COVID, I'm going to die. That's, and, and my wife is going to die, but she's going to get it if I get it or vice versa. But if we look at the hospital admissions and so on, and, and you say you're lucky, but the majority of people who get COVID in some sense replicate you. You didn't finish up in ICU. You didn't finish up in hospital. That's absolutely right. And it is a very sad minority of people that do get very sick and die. And we, we need to be doing everything that we can to protect those kinds of people. But as the evidence, the data, I keep going back to that, emerges, we're starting to build a picture of who these people are. Unfortunately, George, it is as you get older, the risks do multiply with age. Age is risk. But we know the other risk factors as well in terms of underlying illnesses, um, your ethnicity, sadly, is, is also a risk factor, whether you have diabetes, all these things that we know, and we should be hammering home those health messages and protecting these people. But even if you are, but one of the things that we've learned through this, for example, is that even if you are hospitalized, the chances of you going to, into ICU are falling a lot because they're getting better at treating it with things like dexamethasone. Um, I listened to a podcast from a, a consultant in a hospital in Wales, actually, a, another country that I know well, and he was talking about two things. One is that they're not putting people in ICU at nearly the same rate as they were, and the turnaround time, thanks to these treatments of COVID, mean that people are being taken in and put back and, dis and discharged from hospital at a much faster rate than previously. So yes, there's a lot more hope around it if you do get it, that you won't actually get that seriously ill. But unfortunately, some still will. All right, Chris Johns, living in Ireland since 1988, bringing this Anglo-Irish um, view of the whole thing. Can we get back to Ireland to close? Where, in your view, are we now? What is your view of where we are now in Ireland? In, in Ireland, we're doing exactly what the World Health Organization told us not to do. The World Health Organization has said repeatedly the wrong way to treat this is to do rolling lockdowns until the vaccine arrives and nothing else. The World Health Organization has a whole menu of things that we should have been doing. It's all that stuff about testing and tracing. It's all that stuff about public health messaging and that lockdowns, yes, they should be in the toolkit, but they should be low down the list of policy priorities. Other things need to have been done. We didn't do them. We're doing exactly what the World Health Organization told us not to do. Chris Johns, thank you for joining me. Thank you for being with us for what we hope has informed your opinion on this crucial issue for the country and its citizens. Our plan is to continue to bring the best information and research from guests that are leaders in their respective fields. You can keep up to date with everything we do and all our activities on covidrecovery.ie. Thank you.